Right, so it is recording right now. Um, I can't really see this screen on my own monitor here, but that's okay. I think I can still teach the class. All right, so do we have any questions about the class material up to this point? Based on you know, what I you know, what I graded, you know, how I graded um, the lab from last Thursday, I would expect a few questions. Okay, you know, but I'm not hearing any. Okay, because I think the material is starting to get a little bit more complex. We are stacking more things on top of other things, so that means you know the connection between the concepts is becoming more important. Because without those connections to things that we have already learned, or you know, the interconnection between the concepts you know, that are being introduced, um, the labs will only get more and more challenging. Um, you know, because you know, I think you know, based on the grading of the previous one, the one on last Thursday, I just did it today you know, uh, right before class, I think there should be a few people with a few questions. Okay, it is possible that you know, since we only have about 75% of the class here, those people are not here in class yet. That is entirely possible. But if someone did not complete the lab on last Thursday, that is also a strong indication that you know, we might, you know, that person may need to talk to me and you know, see what we can do to kind of help that person to catch up with the rest of the class. Okay, well, since there are no questions, I am going to um, go back and redo that lab just you know, so that I do it once because quite a few people did not work out K1, K2, and K3 properly in that lab. So those people would not be able to complete today's lab either. So I'm going to work on you know, those circuits today. And at the same time, I'm going to follow my own instructions you know, to kind of work out the lab stuff. So as I said, you know, the... Uh, I cannot see what is on the screen right now because you know I can only see through OBS, so it's, it's really indirect that I access the material, which is okay. I can get it to work. It's just not the best thing to, that I can do. All right, so here's uh, the lab from last Thursday, and then I'll go to preview mode so I can just read the instructions of how to do this. All right, so question number one. Question number one is asking what are the, um, why do we need tunnels? So tunnels, if you look up the uh, logistic documentation, it is a way to both, you know, show, you know, what a connection is or what a wire is, and also to allow you to make connections so that, you know, you don't end up with wires running all around the entire circuit because every single tunnel with the same name are technically the same node, which means if for those of you who play portal, it's portal. Okay. If you don't know what I'm talking about, it means you know, everything that connects you know, all the tunnels with the same name, they all connect to the same wires. Okay. So logically speaking, it makes it easier for you to build a circuit because you don't have to go through a lot of overlapping and crossing over and stuff like that. It just makes the whole thing look easier. All right. So the answer to that question is. It identifies connectivity between individual tunnel instances as tunnel inter instances of the same name are logically connected. This is definitely part of the answer. A tunnel with a label automatically connects to components other than tunnels of the same name. That is not true. It is displayed as a visual label. I'm not sure whether that's the answer or not. I'll just click yes. The label is only used when the circuit is printed. That is not correct. So I believe it is these two choices that work. Now, I mean, these ones, you know, you can actually use a infinite monkey approach, which means, you know, you just kind of test out all the possibilities. So how many possibilities do we have? We have a, a question that has four individual possible answers. And so how many possible ways can we combine for checkboxes in theory? You guys should know this answer. It has to do with truth tables. You know the truth tables by now, but okay. So do each, it on the top of my head. <laughs> so each question or each possible answer is a checkbox, and it is independent to all of the other checkboxes, right? So we have two for the first checkbox, 
two for the second checkbox, two for the th third checkbox, and two for the last checkbox. So the question is, are we adding two plus two plus two plus two, or are we multiplying two times two times two times two? Which one do you think is the correct answer? Multiplication, because for each choice of the first checkbox, the second checkbox has two choices. For each way that I can fill in the first and the second checkbox, the third checkbox also have two choices. For each way I fill in the first three checkboxes, the last checkbox also has two ways to you know, fill, of, of being filled in. So we have two to the power of four or 16 possible ways to combine all of those. You can probably rule out the first and the last, which is basically none of the checkboxes should be checked, and all of the checkboxes can be checked. So that gets it down to like 14, okay? I'm not saying that you should you know, use this approach to get the, to get the correct answer, but since you know, I'm only keeping the highest score, that is a way to figuring out the answer, not really as intended, but it is a way. All right. So if I wanted to, I can actually be the worst cheater, you know, in on the entire campus, I think. All right. So this question here is also important because it is really asking, do you know the relationship or do you know how to define P of I, G of I, and Q of I? It is part of the question that says you know, the name of the tunnel corresponds to the lowercase version of those things. So it's really testing your knowledge. It's not testing your understanding. It's testing, testing your knowledge of what we, have, what we have talked about so far in this class. How do we define Q of I? Q of I is the R of X, I, Y, I. But what is R of X, I, Y, I? Well, there's the C function that can get it done. But in base two, we can also use a single exclusive OR gate to do the R function. Okay, so that means the exclusive OR gate over here should connect to, you guys seeing that? Yep, okay. So the exclusive OR gate should connect to Q as a tunnel. What about P and G? I am really sure, okay, that I distinctively said, okay, the definition of P and G is kind of hidden in a single paragraph that does not look, it doesn't stand out at all. And I told the class to specifically write down these definitions on a piece of paper into your own notes. Okay, so G of I is the conjunction of X I Y I, P of I is the disjunction of P I uh, X I Y I. So what that means is in this case, the OR, which is this gate here, connects to P, and then the N here connects to G. So this part is knowledge, okay? It is not even that much about you know, the understanding of the material. It is asking, do you know where to find it? Okay, either in my notes or also you know, in your own notes if you have taken notes. Okay, so this is a knowledge question. All right, so with that said, I am going to, oh, I cannot, uh, it just gets a little bit harder for me to get to the terminal. I just passed it. Nope. Okay, that's that's a little bit harder. Oh, okay, it is on the actual monitor, this one. All right, so what I'm doing is I'm going to construct the circuit, and you know, so this way for people who missed um, the points for that particular lab, for today's lab, you have a good starting point. All right, so java-jar, and then we need a path to find um, logisim. So in my case, you know, I need the path, you know, because, you know, I do everything on the command line. But depending on how you set up your, you know, jar file and whatnot, you know, you may not need to enter the entire path. All right, so it is processor, logisim, there we go. I cannot see it yet because I need to move this to the other monitor. There we go. All right, so what we'll do is in main, I have three input pins. Oh, okay. That, I, I have to distinguish you know, whether the cursor is what you see or the cursor is only on my screen because I, I cannot see what you are seeing, you know, not, um, not in a very native way. 
All right, so we have a three pin input pin, and the first one is X. All right, so it may be duplicated. So the name of the pins really do not have any meaning other than, you know, we're just labeling and say this is X, Y, and then we also have one for K, zero. So this is the very first part of the lab. We just set up the main circuit. And then the output has you know, other things. I don't, think, I don't even think it is actually part of the question for the output. Okay, so there we go. And then we have to set up the, the, the tunnels. All right, so we'll set up the tunnels by going to wiring. Okay, so if you have any questions, you know, in this entire exercise, you know, just let me know because, you know, we really need to understand how to use Logisim in the context of doing the homework assignments. So the tunnel duplicate like that. The tunnels, you know, need to have the same width as the pin. So these two need to be three bit wide. So we go here. We change the number of bits to three, and we can change both of them at the same time. And then this one, we can just call it label X. Now, it is case sensitive. So if you label it as lowercase X or, and lowercase Y, then you have to consistently use you know, the same casing. All right, so that's that. This is really not easy for me because I have to look at basically a shadow of the screen that you're looking at you know, in order to get this done. All right, so that's one part of it, which is the first part. And then we need to get the second part done, which is this part here. This is still in the main circuit. So now we have X, Y, K, zero facing the other way. We have an exclusive OR, a AND gate, and an OR gate. Okay, so we'll go ahead and do all that. So the laziest way to do that is to duplicate all three tunnels. Oh, okay. And then move them around. So control D, duplicate. And then I can move all three to maybe here and then change all three to face in the opposite direction. And here we go. And now we just have to get some of the gates to so we have an exclusive OR. Yeah, that's the one with a bar on the left-hand side. We have a regular OR. And then we have a regular AND. So the shape of the gates is important. Uh, we probably should know the shape of the respective gates at this point. But you can always look it up, so it's not a big deal. They all need to be three bit wide. I want all of them to be narrow. And they all should have two inputs only. So there we go. Now, if you want to look at a gate, you know, in a circuit already in a, already in a circuit, and you want to find out what kind of a gate it is, the quickest way to do it is to select it. Like select it, and it tells you it is an OR gate. Select it, and this one it tells you it is an XOR or exclusive OR gate. So there are uh, tricks you can do to kind of make that happen. All right, so now we need three more tunnels on the other side. We need one for P, one for G, and also one for Q, okay? So we go back to tunnels. Okay, there we go. So I'll make the first one P, okay? And the second one I can make it G. And then the third one, oops. The third one, I'll make it my Q. There we go. It doesn't matter. The ordering is not important. Okay. But all three need to be three bit wide. So I just you know, select all and then change data bits to three. All right. So now the question is you know, which the output of which gate goes to which tunnel on the right hand side. So by definition, we know Q of I is XI exclusive or with YI. Okay, so that means the output of the exclusive OR goes to Q. Q. Exactly. So there we go. Alrighty. And then this is a regular OR. Where, do, where does it go? P. It goes to P. Very good. 
<clears throat> and of course it's red because I have not specified the input. So the output cannot be determined because you know, I don't have any input to those things. All right. And the, the input of all three gates only go to X and Y. K0 is not used at all here because the instruction does not say every single tunnel has to be used. It is just asking how do we make those connections. So I can normally do this a little bit faster, but because of the user interface being a little bit clunky, it takes a little longer than usual. There we go. And then we have Y going here. And then Y also goes here. There we go. All right, finally. All right, so we go back to the question. And this one has a question of, um, I want 0, 0, 1 to be X, 1, 0, 0 to be Y. Okay, so we go to the poking tool. Um, okay, I cannot remember which one is which one. one z 0, 0, 1 goes to X, and then 1, 0, 0 goes to Y. And then we need to poke. Oh, okay, I did not quite make that connection to Q. All right, so that's my bad. So instead of moving the wire, I can always just move the tunnel. Doesn't look as good, but gets the job done. All right, so now we look at this. Poke. There we go. So the second number is the negative three in this case. So the answer to that question is just negative three. All right, so are we doing okay so far at this point? Okay. So to people who are having difficulties, you know, connecting the PGQ to the respective gates, I would say reviewing the material is important because this has nothing to do with understanding the material. It has to do with the knowledge of the material. Okay, so not knowing how P of I, G of I, or Q of I are defined is going to make this class really challenging, especially when we get to the exam. All right, so question number three says, you know, now you have to create the K1 circuit, and I gave you a template. And in the instruction, it specifically say, make sure that the relative vertical position of the P, G, and K0 input pins are as shown, which means P has to be on top, G is the one in the middle, and then K0 is at the bottom. That part is important because without conforming to these the locate positioning, um, my test driver is not going to work. And if my test driver does not work, points will be deducted. Even if the circuit is 100% correct, it will still be deducted. Why? Hmm? Didn't follow instructions, but more importantly, it does not meet the quote unquote specifications. So why is it so important to meet the specifications? Because you know, if it shows that I can do this, you know, why do I need to meet the specifications? I will give you the example of a Mars rover that did not quite make it. The Mars rover, the rocket control you know, circuitry and also the distance measuring you know, circuitry were done correctly, except one was you know, the units to be in meters, the other one is outputting yards. Each component is working correctly. You know, the, the distance measuring thing is measuring correctly, it's reporting 300. And then the rocket engine control you know, the circuit is also working correctly. If we need to decelerate gently, you know, and assuming we are at a distance of 300, we need to use this kind of throttle, except one is talking in yards and the other one is talking in meters. So it did not work in the end because one of the components did not meet the specification that we are going to use SI units, meters. Okay, can you imagine how expensive that thing is? Okay, we launch it, it goes all the way to Mars and it is the landing sequence that failed and then the whole thing just crashed. 100 million easily gone. All right. So that's why specifications are important, okay? It's not just that, you know, oh, but I can show that I understand how to do this. Yes, but you also have to do it as specified. That is important. Okay, so I get back to here, and then I go to project, 
add a circuit because now we are working on K1 as a circuit. So K1 as a circuit has three input pins, okay? The first one is P, okay? This is just for labeling. This is not significant at all, but it does give me an understanding myself to know which one is which one. So we got P, we got G, and then we got K0. I'll fix the width in just a little bit, okay? So this is K0. And then the output pin is a single bit, so it is over here. And then we have this as K1. And then these two need to be three bit wide. Okay, so we just change the width data bits to three. Okay, there we go. So now we have the template. And this is also the same template for the other circuits as well. So if you want to copy and paste this to K2 and K3, that's fine. Okay, you know, I'm not going to do any copy and paste right now. So now the question is, what do I do? <clears throat> uh, the instruction says you know, use splitters to split P and G to the bits that we, you, you need to compute K1 using the carry look ahead mechanism. Refer to the binary addition module for the exact formula. Okay, so you need to know what are we talking about? What is carry look ahead? What is the other way to get to the carry bits? What is the, the name of the other mechanism? Carry <clears throat> starts with R. Carry ripple, exactly. So the other method is called carry ripple, which is the added that I did in the class and I demonstrated that already. This is carry look ahead. So the question now is, um, where do we find that? So we go to the addition module, binary addition module. This entire section six talks about carry look ahead. And the K1 is specifically worked out here. So the next question now is, um, okay, can you, yep, you can see that. So the next question is, but this looks like a multiplication and an addition. I already said in class, this is my shorthand for what? What is the plus represented? It's a logical or, and what looks like a multiplication is the end. Very good. All right, so the priority, so what do I do? Do I do the OR between the G0 and the P0 and then end the entire thing to K0? Because you know, if, if I do not remember operator priority, that would be what I do. But the operator priority, which is implicit in basically all of your math classes, will tell you which one, which operator has priority. If you're, if you're just looking at multiplication versus addition, which one has priority? The multiplication. In this case, it is the end. So that means it is as if we have hidden parentheses around P0, K0 here. Because the notation using the multiplication notation implies that it has a higher operator priority. So we have P0 ended with K0. The output of that end is then ORed with the G0 in order to give us K1. Are we okay with that notation? Because you know, throughout this entire semester, we'll get these notations over and over again. So it is important to get it now so that you know, we don't have any additional questions. So if this is new, okay, if you have not been exposed to these concepts, then you need to write it down. Okay, because you know you need to write it down so that it stands out. So the next time you look at something like this, you know how to interpret it. All right, so if this is the circuit, then I need to go back here. The instruction is already telling us that we need splitters. So we'll go to um, the splitter, which is the first, first one. <clears throat> and we need a splitter you know, that has a bit width of three because otherwise you get an orange line and things do not work out. And I'm just going to split it to three anyway. So this way, you know, I can choose not to use you know, some of the split end if I do not need to use the split end, but I have all three bits available to me. So now we have P connected to a splitter, but I'm going to copy and paste the splitter here because G would, would also need it. All right. What is the job of a splitter? Okay, that's another question because not only are the lecture material and also the reading material are connected to the past ones, the labs 
also have their own chain of dependency or their own, you know, um, yeah, I would just call it dependency because, you know, by this time, I'm expecting people to understand what a splitter is, how it works, and how to use a splitter in order to get to what you need to get. So a splitter can connect to a multi-bit thing, like so, and then each output or each split end can now correspond to one or more of the input. So the splitter all depends on how you set up bit 0, bit 1, and bit 2 in this case, because we have three bit as the bit width of the splitter. So in this case, which is the default, the top one is bit 0, the second one is bit 1, and then the bottom one is bit 2. So I'm just going to continue to use this, this standard. So what do I have now? I now have seven individual bits. I have from the top to the bottom, I have P0, P1, P2. Those are all individual bits. We have G0, G1, G2. Those are all individual bits. And then we have K0, which is you know, coming from the input pin. So we, we now have seven bits available. doesn't mean that I have to use all seven bits. I just need to use whatever I need and leave the other split end unconnected, which is perfectly fine. Are there any questions at this point about how we use a splitter, what a job is, you know, and how do we configure it? Now, if you want this to look really nice, you can change the splitters to only have one single split end and it only give you bit zero out of P and out of G. That will make the circuit look nicer because you don't have any dangling your split end that doesn't connect to anything. I'm just going to leave it like this, okay, to kind of emphasize that, oh, by the way, we just need bit zero of P and G. All right, so even I can remember, you know, P, uh, G0 connects straight to the uh, OR gate. So now we need an OR gate, you know, as the final stage, okay? And then over here, we needed to have exactly just three, in, two inputs in this case, and make it a narrow one. And we know that P0, no, G0, excuse me, so G0 goes straight to the OR gate. And that has to do with the equation. So if I switch back to the equation, G0 is on one side of the OR. So that means that this G0 is by itself one of the inputs into the OR gate. And then the other side is the result of the AND. So now we have to take P0 and AND it with K0. So now we take P0, which is bit 0 of P, and, uh, well, we need, to, we need an AND gate to do this, don't we? So we pick up an AND gate, and then configure it kind of in the same way. Okay, so this is kind of tedious, but it's necessary. So P0 goes to one input of the AND, K0 goes to the other input of the AND, and then the result of the end goes into the other input of the OR. And then the output of the OR is the answer that we want. So we just go connect this one to K1. And now we have K1 as a circuit done. And of course, you, know, you want to be able to confirm that. So you switch to the appearance mode. Um, I already know how the pins are supposed to be laid out. So I really technically do not need to label you know, the P, G, K0, and also K1, but it's always good to have things documented. So I really kind of encourage people to do this. So this way, when you use this circuit in main, you know how to connect the, the pins. So we have K0 as the input, K1 is the output, and now we have the circuit. Do we have any questions at this point? Okay, we're good. Okay, all right. Then I will go ahead and test it because the instruction said, you know, okay, let's go ahead and test this and making sure, make sure that it works. So go into the main circuit and then you use K1 as if it is a built-in component, which means you single click it and then you can place it down into the main circuit like so. And of course, it doesn't have any connectivity at this point. So what you can do is you can also, you can always use tunnels, okay? So if you if that is how you want to do things, that's fine. Just duplicate these two tunnels, kind of drag it out here, 
flip the direction so it looks nicer, and then connect the P to the P, the G to the G, and then K, uh, K0 goes to K0. So this is P goes to P, and then G goes to G. There we go, and then K0 goes to K0. So this one is, yeah, it'll work like that. All right, so the way we test it is, you know, the instruction said, if at least one, two of x0, y0, or k0 are ones, then k1 should be a one. Okay, that's the what the instruction said. So you should test it. Right now, you know, everything is a zero. So k0 is outputting a zero. How can we see that? It's hard to see from your perspective. But if you magnify, you can see the output of K0 is a dark green. Okay, if you hook up a wire, it is clear. It is a dark green. Dark green means zero in larger sim. It's not a one. So I don't even need to hook it up to a pin to actually see what it is. I can just look at the wire and be able to tell that it is a zero at this point. Well, we actually have KX0 being a one already, but having just X0 being a one is not enough to make K1 a one, so I need another one with either K0 or Y0. So I can look at K0, turn it into a one, and now K1 is a one. So that seems to be working. So you can play with this a little bit and find out you know, how to make K1 a one, okay, and when to turn it into a zero, and if it seems to work, then you got K1 done. This step is kind of important because until you know that K1 is done, I would not move on to K2 or K3 because they are more complicated circuits. Are we still doing okay so far with the circuit? Okay. But can you guys all, can, can, can we see how this relates to the lecture material? Because the lab is about connecting concepts. Okay, we are exercising the concepts which are kind of abstract, kind of dry, kind of boring, you know, in the text and we are making circuits out of those things, and then we can poke the wires, we can poke the input pins, we can actually test out the circuit. So are we doing okay? All right. So now we work on K2 and K3. Okay, so these add circuit, K2, and the thing is you can copy and paste. So I'm gonna copy and paste from K1, even though it's not exactly the same, because you know, I can recycle a lot of the components you know, from K1 in K2. So now we have K2 already kind of, I would say half finished. So we just need to get rid of all the wires. The best way to get rid of a bunch of wires is to select first. Okay, that didn't quite work out the way that I want. So you just have to select the wires that you want to remove. Like so, and well, I'll leave this one around. Okay. Do you guys have any questions for me? I mean, if you do, you know, it's probably good for the, the rest of the class, too. So, so questions? When you were select your K1 when you get back to the main one, you were testing it, right? Yes. Uh -huh. So, did you get the dark main, but then you play with the numbers and then you have a highlighter? Highlighted green, which is a one. Which is a one. Yes. Um, like, can you just explain a little more the, the testing part of it? So okay. Well, it has to do with, okay, the best way to explain that is to look at this equation here. So if you look at this equation, make a truth table out of it, and then you can, you know, we already know that G0 is the conjunction of X, zero, y zero, right? So that means if x, x zero is a one, y zero is a one, g zero is gonna be one. And because g zero is ordered with the rest, if g zero is a one, then k one is gonna be one. So that tells me that if x zero is a, and x zero is a one and y zero is a one, then k one has to be a one. Does that make sense? So failing that, okay, which means at least one of x0 or y0 is not a one, then we still have a second chance. The second chance is the conjunction between k0 and p0. 
which means if I want P0 and K0 to be a one, what is the requirement? What, 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 is, what, what comes to your mind right away and say, oh, that has to be a one? If I want P0 and K0 to be a one, because that's my second chance to get a one out of K1, what does that tell you immediately? Hmm? They both have to be ones. Very good. So because we want a conjunction for an and to be a one, so that means P0 has to be a one, K0 also has to be a one. K0 is an input pin by itself, so we'll just say, oh, okay, that input pin has to be a one. But on top of that, what else do we need? We need P0 to be a one. What is the definition of P0? It is x0 or y0. Very good. Okay. So if I want x0 or y0 to be a 1, what is that telling us? How do you make a disjunction or an or be a true or a 1? At least one of them has to be a 1. So that means on top of k0 itself being a 1, one of x0 or y0 also has to be a 1. So that gives us all the test cases, right? You know, how do we turn K1 into a one? You look at the equation, you look at the constraints based on the operators, and that actually tells us how to make K1 true. How do we make it false? Well, if you want to make it false, that means G0 has to be false. But it's pretty easy to make G0 itself false because it is the conjunction of X0 and Y0. So that means you know, if one of those two is a zero, then G zero is going to be false. Okay, so we take we, that takes care of you know uh, G zero itself being false. But because this is an or, we also need P zero K zero to be false. To make P zero and K zero to be false, the easiest way to make it false is K zero itself being false, right? But there's also another chance because you can also make P zero false. How do we make P zero false? There's only one way to make P0 false. What is it? It depends on how P0 is defined. This is probably the fourth time I say this. P0 is X0 or Y0. And I want P0 to be false. What, what is the only way to make P0 false? X and Y both have to be zeros. Yep, X and Y both have to be zeros. Okay. So those are the ways that we analyze the equation by itself so that we understand, okay, in this particular case, it has to be one. In this case, it has to be false. How many test cases do we have? If you just look at the dependency, okay, so this is one way to think about problems is to focus on dependency. The value of K1 depends on what? G0, P0, and K0. But... G0 itself depends on X0, Y0. P0 also depends on X0, Y0. So how many independent bits are we working with here? What are the, in, which ones of the input bits determine the value of K1? That's what I'm asking. So what are the input pins to make? X0, Y0. X0, Y0, K0. That is correct. So we have three bits, right? Three individual binary digits, okay? That will determine the value of K1. How many test cases can you generate out of that? We worked on something like this earlier because you know, when I was talking about the multi-choice you know, uh, question, yeah, eight cases, very good. Because X0 can be true or false. When X0 is true, Y0 can be true or false also, right? When X0 is true, Y0 is true, then K0 can also be true or false. So it is two times two times two. There are eight possible cases. Okay. Now, do you have to go through all eight test cases to convince yourself that your circuit is working? Probably not, okay? You know, because if you work out like three or four cases and they all work out kind of correctly, you can kind of get a gist that, okay, maybe that's working. OK, so that is how we kind of progress with this lab as we work on it. OK, 
But it is really important to go back to the module. I know the way I write may not be exactly the best way that can be written, but the definitions are always very important. So if you get a PDF, okay, out of this whole thing, you just control P, print it to a PDF, you get a PDF. You can print it out on a piece of paper, use a highlighter, okay, highlight all of those definitions, okay? And some of the definitions may not look like definitions, like exclusive or, okay? When I talk about exclusive or, it does not look like a definition, but it really is a definition. So you have to highlight and identify all of the definitions so they're easy for you to find. That's one way to do it. The second way is to use a little bit of your time and copy the definitions onto your own notes. Okay, because you'll indicate in the exam, you can bring anything you want, okay, anything that's on paper. So you can bring the notes that I have written here, okay, that's what I would do, because I wrote this, I know where to find my stuff. But you didn't write this, it doesn't make it easy for you to find stuff, you know, in, in the module like this. So you need to bring your own notes so that it's easier for you to find the definitions. All right, so we are moving on because the next circuit is K2. This is K2. So K2 has three equations corresponding to it. Which one should I use for the circuit? And why do you think I should use that one? The what? The first one, like the first line? And so what, what would be the reason for me to do the second and the third line of derivation if the first line is what we need? Yep. K1 relies on K0 to be calculated using that first line. Exactly. So we do not want to use the first one because K2 depends on K1. And that defeats the entire purpose of carry look ahead. Okay? Because I'm pretty sure we talked about you know, how the linear dependency is causing the carry ripple adder to be slow because it's proportional. The amount of time is proportional to the number of bits. And carry look ahead is the way to get around that problem. Okay? So we don't want the first one. What about the second one? The second one does not refer to K1 anymore. So can we use that one? The answer is no, because you still have one more level of gates that we need to do. Because you need one gate to do this, one to do this, so there are two stages of gates, then you need one more to do this and here, that's three levels of gates, and then one last one to do this uh, or here. So there are four levels of gates to get it done, which once again defeats the whole purpose of carry look ahead. The last one only requires two levels of gates. The first level of gates will do this and, and this and at the same time. When those ends give you the results, then everything feeds to the OR gate, so we only have two stages of logic gates to go through, so that's why we prefer the third one. And also just from the um, reasoning perspective of why does tech go through all this calculation and give us the third form, just from that perspective, is telling you we should probably use the third one. Even if I don't understand gate propagation whatsoever, the fact that we went through this entire derivation suggests that the last one is the one that we should use. Is that making any sense? Okay, so we'll, we'll work out the third one. Okay, so the third one is G1 or P1 and G0 or P0, P1 and P0 and K0. All right, so we, we'll go back to the circuitry here. We go to K2 and then we'll work it out. So the AND gate that is going to be used here is going to have three inputs. So I'm, I'm making a copy of the one that still has two inputs only, and then change this one to have three inputs. There we go. And the three inputs would be K0, P0, P1. So this is P0. It goes into one of those pins. And then P1 goes into the other the only remaining pin of the three input AND gate, like so. And then the one that has two inputs, okay, we go back here, it will be uh, ANDing the P1 and the G0. 
So we will take P1, which is this wire, and let it go to one of the inputs here. And then G0 is going to go into the other input of this AND gate. And then the output of this one goes to, oh, okay, I forgot that the OR gate also needs three inputs now. So we go here, we change the number of inputs to three, and then we connect, you know, just the output of the two AND gates to two of the inputs of the OR gate, like so. And then we have one dangling here. And we have already used up all the output of the AND gate. So we go back to the equation and go like, okay, one of the input of the OR gate goes straight to one of the P or the G bits. It is G1 in this case. So we go to G, we look up where's G1, and then we just have to route it, and in this case in a pretty ugly way, to the remaining input of the OR gate. And now we have K2. All right, so do we have any questions about how this circuit is constructed, how it relates to the carry look ahead equation corresponding to K2? Are we good here? Okay, all right. And then we move on to the last one, which is K3. So once again, I would do a copy and paste. So control C, copy, and then we go to project, Add circuit K3, case sensitive, okay, make sure that we don't get, we don't put in extra spaces, and then just do a paste. So now we switch back to this here. Now, even I wrote this, okay, I cannot remember the equations, okay, I know what the pattern looks like, but if you were to ask me, oh, so what is K3, I really have to go back to look it up. So K3 is a little more complex, the OR gate needs four inputs now. And then we need one AND gate that has four inputs, one AND gate that has three inputs, one AND gate that has two inputs, and then G2 is by itself feeding directly into the OR gate. So we go back to the circuit here and go like, okay, fine, we just need to have some pretty massive editing. So that usually means, you know, any wiring that you already have here, they probably won't work anymore. So I'm just, usually I just, you know, remove all the wires and then you know just reconnect things you know from scratch okay so i need both this and gate um, i need to bump up the number of gates you know inputs for the gates here so i would need one more and this one as well as this one need four inputs and this is really kind of cool because note how i have just selected one and gate and one or gate they are different gates but since you know, they share a lot of other common attributes, I can change the input pins all at the same time. So I can change both of them to have four input pins at the same time. Kind of handy. It's a handy feature. You, know, you don't have to use it, but it saves you time if that is what you need to do. The four input AND gate is actually the easiest one to work out because all it needs are the three inputs or the three uh, bits from P. So we'll just have to route the P0 to the first input, P1 to the second input. Yes, this part of the class can be a little bit boring because I'm not working with the best user interface here because I, I'm looking at a slightly delayed you know, uh, visual on this uh, computer. And then this output just goes to, yeah, we'll pick the bottom one. All right, so we got one done. What about the three input AND gate? That will take P2, P1, and G0, okay? So we have, uh, we can just tap some of these pins here. So we have P, okay, I cannot remember already, P2, P1, okay. So we have P2, P1, so we have, this is P2. And then we have P1. And then we have G0, okay, so here's G0 here. Okay, we go here, and then we fly across, and then this goes to one other input of the OR gate, like so, okay. And then we look at the two input, which is P2, G1. So once again, we tap from G, P2, which is this Y here. 
This is P2. It also needs some G1. I could have made it look a little nicer, but that's okay. And then connect the output of this to this input. And then G2 is by itself you know, connecting to the last input of the OR gate. Now we have K3. Now I forgot to change you know, the output pin name, so I should probably do, oops, uh, double click. So you know, just to make sure that the documentation, you know, the labeling is consistent with the circuit, I would do that. And also, you know, um, I should probably update the appearance because otherwise I cannot tell which one is which one. Now, technically speaking, this is all I need to get the score that, you know, 100% of the score for the lab on Thursday, okay? I don't even need to put this into the main circuit, but I think it is probably a good idea to go to K2 and change the appearance to at least say this is K2. Because even though I know the pin out the, the pin position of the input, I probably need to distinguish P K2 from K3. So I just do the minimal work to kind of make sure that I know which one is K2 and which one is K3. Not for what you need to turn in on last Thursday, but for what we are going to do today. All right. So technically speaking, I got K1, K2, K3 all done. And since I gave you guys you know, until the end of the day on last Thursday, which means you got plenty of time, um, what should we do next? Should I just save the file and then submit it? We should test it because the test driver is already here. So we should test it. So that means I need to save the file first. Okay, you know, I actually did not save the file often enough because just in case Logisim you know, decides to crash, we don't want to, what, what, it happened to one of you, right? Yeah, it happened to you. Okay, so, <laughs> so we want to save the file, you know, as 3x3ca, and then click save, okay? So now I can get out of Logisim on, in the GUI <coughs> mode, and then we'll get into the um, command line mode to run Logisim. So I would just you know, kind of repeat the previous command. So I, I put files all over the place. You know, so you know, for me, you know, I need to do a little bit more work. Uh, the test driver, I'm not even sure that I have downloaded the test driver. So let's make sure that I know where the test driver is. So we move on and, you know, okay, you guys can you know, answer the rest of the questions. All I want here is to find where's the test driver and what is the log supposed to look like. This is a test driver. And we save link as because you know, um, none of the operating systems knows how to open this natively. So we'll just go ahead and download the test driver. Um, all right, so that's, we'll go ahead and replace that in CISP310 as a folder. And this is the log file. And we'll go ahead and download that as well, save link as. <clears throat> And we already have that, but that's okay. We can just override it or overwrite it as well. All right, so now I got everything available. So because I'm using Linux, this is how I get to the subfolder that contains everything. So we have test driver um, 3x3ca.circ. Um, and then we use dash tty table. This will you know, basically make uh, Logisim not open up in the GUI mode, instead it will open it in the command line mode. And when you press the enter key, it wants to find, oh, actually it does, it finds the, um, the file already because it's already in that folder. So it gives you an output like this. The, so if you want to do a visual inspection, you can look at the output here and look at the proper output from the log file and just visually check and see if they are the same. That is not recommended. Because, you know, we have just seen a bunch of zeros and ones. The chances that you miss one of those is pretty high, okay? It's almost 100% certainty in my case, okay? Missing a zero or one. So the way to do this is to capture the output, okay? Run the same command, but then use a greater than sign to capture the output to a file. Now, where you want to put that file is up to you, okay? I'm just capturing this to the temp folder called log. 
Okay. So now if I use a you know, kind of plain editor to look at the log file, now I have everything stored in the file. So the next thing you can do is to use a tool to compare those two files. The comp uh, tool in uh, Windows will tell you that the files have you know, different file sizes because the way end of line works is different between Linux and Windows. So it doesn't give you a very good you know, comparison result. So the best way to do it is to get a tool called div. And if you don't want to install anything like that, you can go for a web div tool. Okay, just go to Google search, look for web div tool. And then we have dev, uh, div checker. And I'm not sure whether this one has a web interface. The second one definitely has a web interface and online div tool. So it will give you two windows. Okay, this is one. And this is the other one. So all you have to do is to paste the content of one file, which is my log file, put it here, and then put the log file you know, um, of the downloaded version over here, and then click you know, compare. It will tell you whether those two files are the same. And if they're different, it will highlight the lines that are different. And that, will, that should help you understand what is wrong with the circuit, or at least which circuit is wrong. Alrighty. So that's kind of how you know, this lab you know, should be done. Do we have any questions? No questions? All right. So I have just talked about a lot of stuff. You know, you know I'm not sure whether you guys have been taking notes um, because you know, all that stuff you know, is going to be helpful okay, for the rest of the entire semester. All right, so I have just you know gave you guys you know, the um, correct um, circuit for K1, K2, as well as K3. So if you suspect that yours is not working 100% based on the score of your lab on last Thursday, then you can go ahead and use the design that I have today. But I'm not giving you the file, okay? So you still have to kind of go through the process to kind of create K1, K2, and K3, or edit your own, okay, you know, in case you, know, you want to make some changes to yours. Are we doing okay so far? We good? Okay, so we got some feedback. Okay. Um, so in case you're not comfortable with the material that we have introduced at this point, uh, my office hour is right before class from 8 to 9 in my office, which is uh, STEM 316. I'm usually available after class as well, um, especially on the Tuesday, because on Thursday, you know, we'll have the computer science club meeting in this same room right after our lab is over. So for those of you who want to kind of participate in, computer, in the computer science club event, you can just stay here. And then we'll have your know, fun doing you know, computer science club stuff. Any questions? Yep. Is the command to be a lock for your um, SD? Hmm? Yeah, that's great. You do okay? So he's just trying to find his own grade, or he's trying to set it up as a log, like how you would save. Oh, okay. From mm -hmm. your test driver as a separate log file. Yeah, so that's done by you know the greater than sign here. Okay. All right. Any questions? Okay. Do you guys know how to do all this stuff in <clears throat> Windows in the command line of Windows or Mac OS? If you have a Mac with you. Questions? Okay, all right. So, um, yeah, the test driver is here to help you get a perfect score. Because if you run through the test driver and something does not work, then you know that your circuit is probably not working 100%. Then it's time to go back and double check things, or at least you'll ask people about it. All right. We're all good? 
Okay, all right. So I'm going to take row. Okay, so we will take a break because I. This may be intensive. It may not be intensive. Um, so we'll go ahead and take row. It's a uh, 2023 um, 09-12, because today is the 12th. And I'll show you the access code. I believe it is 2C, 2 as in the digit 2, and then C as in the lowercase letter C. And the time is, uh, I gave people all the way to 10.30 to do this. I don't know why I gave people that much time, but you know. I think I just got the hour wrong, that's all. Is that okay? That's okay. All right, cool. Good, good. All righty. Are there any questions about the connection between the concepts? I'm asking because I have a student coming to my office yesterday, and you know, there was a uh, mis there's, there's no connection you know, from the pers perspective of the student of how things connect. Uh, in that case, it was specifically um, what is the relationship between Q of I R of X, I, Y, I, and the exclusive one. You know, it, it wasn't clear to the student how those things are connected. Um, so do you have a question? If you do have a question, you know, the best way to do it is to ask it during class. But if you don't feel like you're comfortable, comfortable to ask the questions in class, then come to my office hour, which is one hour before the class starts. Okay, then we can we'll talk about those concepts and how you know, the concepts relate to each other. Because understanding is not memorization. It is about making connections, logical connections between the concepts. So are we doing okay so far? Okay, we, got, we see some nods, but not the entire class. All right. <clears throat> so we are, you know, we are now done with Addition, we already talked about subtraction. So we are back to talking about the assigned versus unsigned interpretation. And um, let me start up the... Um, Alrighty, so we'll go ahead and... There we go. Okay. So what we'll do, you know, what what I'll do right now is to present to you, you know, the signed interpretation versus the unsigned interpretation of integers. So we are given x as a binary number. <coughs> V, U, X, N is the unsigned interpretation of X using N bits. So that's how you know, V, U is defined. So what we'll do is we'll just go ahead and I'll give you the equation. So VU, the unsigned value represented by a bit pattern X, and we use up to N bits, is something that should be familiar to you. Okay. So the first question is, does that look familiar to you? The answer is yes, I know exactly where that equation or where that sigma notation was mentioned before, and I know the context of that you know, particular you know, mentioning of this sigma notation. 
great. Okay, but the if the answer is I'm not sure, you know, I'm not sure that we have seen this before. So let me see if I can remind you. This was this was there was a very similar kind of equation that we used in base conversion. Yep. What is that under the sigma? Uh, I equals to zero. That's an I. Okay. <laughs> yeah, that's a poor written I, poorly written I. This is I equals to zero to N minus one. I was like, where is T? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's an I. <laughs> <clears throat> so this was discussed in base conversion, or how do we find a value represented by a number in a particular base? In this case, the base is fixed to be two. It is not a B. Um, and we also limit ourselves to only n digits. When you look at the sigma notation, you know, you go like, but this is n minus 1. How do we have n digits? That's because we start from 0. Okay, if you start from 0, 0 is one of the digits, of x0 is the least significant digit. So that's why the sigma only goes up to n minus 1 in order to make use of exactly n digits. So are we okay with this format? Okay. So let me give you an example and see if you guys can give me the answer. Okay, so this is a test to see if we understand the notation. So if x is 1, 1, 0, 1, 1 in base 2, and it's 4, what is the result of that? So we have a binary number, 1, 1, 0, 1, 1. We want to use 4 bits and we want the unsigned interpretation, what do we end up with? So what, how are you going to solve this problem? You look at the sigma notation, and you expand it. Okay. So you ask, when i equals to 0, what are we getting? When i equals to 0, then we get 1 times 2 to the power of 0, that 1 being this one here. When i equals 1, we also get 1 times, but this time it's 2 to the power of 1, because we are looking at this one here. What if i equals 2? Then we get a 0, because this 0 is corresponding to that 0 here. It is multiplied to 2 to the power of 2. And then we have 1 again, because we are looking at the you know, digit 3. Then it is multiplied by 2 to the power of 3. So what do we have in the end? have 1 plus 2 plus 8, and that is a 11. Okay, so it is 11 in base 10. What about the extra one over here? Well, it's not part of the, the deal, because you know, we mentioned that we only want to use 4 bits not the entire five bits. So you can be given a longer bit pattern, and we can just say, ignore those you know, higher you know, or the more significant digits, because we are only interested in bit up to this many bits from bit zero. Are we doing OK so far with the notation and the example of how we expand the sigma notation? You okay or not? Okay. All right. So then we can look at the signed interpretation. So Vs is the signed value represented by x as a bit pattern, and we are only using n bits. Okay. Is something that looks very similar, except this time we have n minus 2 as the upper bound of the index i. We still have xi you know, times 2 to the power of i. And then we have this subtraction here that is outside of the sigma, making use of x subscript n minus 1, which is the most significant bit in this case, times 2 to the power of n minus 1. OK? So when you look at vu versus vs, the only difference is in vu, the most significant digit is also added to the sum. And you know, as opposed to the most significant digit is subtracted from the sum in the case of a signed interpretation. That's the only difference. 
and it makes all the difference. Okay, no pun intended. <clears throat> yep. VS is supposed to be unsigned, VU, or VS is signed. VS is signed, VU is unsigned. Mm -hmm. Did I write it wrong? No, no, you're good. Okay. Clarification. Yep. All right. So we're going to use the same example, the same bit pattern, and only use up to four bits you know, of that you know, bit pattern and see how that works out in this case. So VS of 11011 in base two, using only four of those bits. Okay. So the first part is the same, right? You know, one times two to the power of zero, this one being bit zero, plus. 1 times 2 to the power of 1, this being bit 1, plus 0 times 2 to the power of 2, this 0 being bit 2. So those are all the same, but this is where the sigma ends, okay? The sigma notation only accounts for 3 of the 4 bits, because the most significant bit, which is bit 3 in this case, is you know, the, the power of 2 corresponding to that particular bit is not added to the sum. It is subtracted from the sum. So now we have minus 1 times 2 to the power of 3, this 1 being bit 3 over here. Oops, just made a mistake here. Let me fix that. This is a minus. So now what do we have? We have 1 plus 2 minus 8 for a for final value of Negative five, very good. So that is how we can represent negative values. Is we change the way we interpret a single, you know, the same bit pattern. Yep. Based on the way you wrote that equation, should you be subtracting n minus one for each? Say that one more time. Like the way you wrote the equation, uh -huh. subtracting uh, x n minus one. Would that help? Okay. Okay. So, hmm. so the, the the most immediate question, okay, that most people would have. Yes, go ahead. So, does displaying the number via signed or unsigned change the value? It changes. So, okay, a bit pattern has no particular value right. associated I'm, with I'm it. I'm just wondering how we managed to get a negative value from something that should not be negative. That should not be negative. Why should it not be negative? Why is the signed interpretation <coughs> negative? That's not a negative number. Well, it's a bunch of zeros and ones. In other <laughs> words, if you if you use a probe, you know, on the transistors. You will see that this transistor has the output being what being high, this is low, this is high, this is high, this is low. So there's no intrinsic interpretation to it. <clears throat> so it is everything is just an interpretation. Then what is the point of this? That is a very good question. Okay, because you know, the, most people when they look at this, the first question they, that will pop up in the head is if I see you know just one zero one one. Is it representing 11 or is it representing negative 5? That's, that's a very natural question after this discussion. My response to that particular question would seem to be jaded. It would seem to be kind of abrasive, but it is actually the correct response. Because my response to that question, well, let me rephrase, okay? The question was, okay, the question I think you guys may be asking is, is 101111 or is it negative 5? My response to that is, why do you care? Why do you care? What are you doing with a bit pattern? What are, what are you doing to 1011? Because for all we know, 1011 may mean, you know, in, on the display, we have, you know, put, put, in, put a drop of ink here. Not, do not put a drop of ink here. Put a drop of ink here and also here. In other words, it is a part of your printout on a piece of paper. Or it can be on a display. It can be you know, what you store on a drive. It may be a part of the ASCII code you know, to store a character. So the bit pattern of 1011 
has no intrinsic meaning to it. It is until you give the bit pattern a purpose, then you have to interpret it in a certain way. In other words, if you have a variable as a counter, okay, and you say, I need to count up to 14, okay, then I need to do something else. Okay, I stay in the loop as long as I'm counting up to and including 14. So in that case, you, want, you probably want to use you know, 11 as the, um, as the value, as the interpretation, because when you're counting the number of iterations, do you ever need to go to negative values? No, okay? So that means you know, in that particular application of the big pattern as a counter, then it makes sense to use the unsigned interpretation, okay? What about the negative interpretation? When do we use a negative interpretation? Well, when you are you know, storing the uh, result of measurement, you know, let's say of temperature, okay, and you are storing in units of Celsius, degree Celsius. Well, that can go positive. It can also go negative. Negative. So in that case, you know, negative five is a possible value that you might want to store. Now the range is really short, you know, small in this case. We'll talk about the range of signed interpretation, not today, but in a different class. The bottom line is there's no intrinsic meaning to 1011. One, one. It really, it's literally, literally just saying we have bit, bit 0 being a 1, bit 1 being a 1, bit 2 being a 0, and a bit 3 being a 1. But how do we use it? It's, it's, the bit pattern does not tell you how it is supposed to be used. So I will give you one more thing to kind of help you know, help clarify this. The one time, if you're adding, it doesn't matter. If you're subtracting, it does not matter you know, which way you want to interpret. It is only when you compare that it becomes important. Okay, so I'm going to give you this question. I have 0, 0, 0, 1 in base 2. I have 1, 0, 1, 1 in base 2. I want to see if one is less than the other because I'm, you know, do, I'm using a sorting algorithm. Okay, I need to know which value is less than which other value so I can, so the sorting algorithm can work. Okay, so does that sound like a practical scenario? Okay, sorting, right? But what am I sorting? Am I sorting something that cannot be negative or am I sorting values that can go negative? Because the interpretation makes you know, a big difference now. Because using the unsigned interpretation, this is a one being compared to 11 in base 10? The answer is yes, it is less than. But if I'm using a signed interpretation, which means you know the four bits are being used to store something that can be positive or also negative, then I'm comparing one versus negative five in base 10. Then the answer is no, one is not less than negative five. So it is only when we have a purpose, you know, then we have to determine how to interpret the big pattern. Is it representing negative 5 or is it representing 11? Yep. So essentially, do you want it to succeed or do you want it to fail? No. It's not about whether I want it to succeed or fail. It is about, you know, the context of the comparison. Should I use your know, signed interpretation or should I use unsigned interpretation? So this is the reverse when it comes to C++ programming. If you think about C++ programming, every variable, every integer variable, is already either signed or unsigned because that's the way you declare the variable. So by the time you compare, the compiler goes like, okay, so are you an unsigned you know, in integer? Are you also an unsigned integer? If they're both unsigned integer, we'll, we'll use the first method in, and interpret everything in the unsigned manner. On the other hand, if you have int versus int, which is by default signed, then the compiler will generate the code and, and interpret both integers in the signed way. Okay, so that's why you know, we have this problem, because in C++ programming, the type or how you intend to use a variable is already assigned to the variable when it was created. Okay, so there's never a confusion, never a question of how we should treat the bit pattern. But in assembly language programming, in low level stuff, 
a bit pattern is just a bit pattern. It has no type whatsoever associated with it. It is typeless. It is until we actually try to do something with a value, such as comparison, then we have to think about, oh, so now that we're comparing, how should we do the comparison? Should I treat these numbers as signed or unsigned? So that's a very change, it's a very important change of perspective because the type is not associated with a bit pattern anymore. The type is associated with what you intend to do, to do with the bit pattern. Does that, is that making sense or not? It will make more sense by the time we get to some of the coding stuff that we will do later. But at this point, you know, maybe it doesn't make much sense yet. But what we need to do is to go back to the definition. Remember, definitions are important because we have to go back to the definition and simply say that, okay, there are two definitions. One has to do with getting the unsigned value, unsigned value represented by X using N bits. The other one is let's look at the signed interpretation of the value of the bit pattern X using N bits. So that's basically what we need to do at this point is simply to look at these definitions so that we can so that I can ask you and say what is negative four you know as a bit pattern using only four bits you should be able to answer that question. Alrighty, so the lecture is done. I know I'm running a little bit over time, <clears throat> and we have a lab today. Can anyone guess what is the name of today's lab? We dealt with part one on last Thursday, so today, so today we have part two. So let me go here. So part two is right here. So I'm unhiding part two. And then the access code is not what you think it is, because the last time it was 3x3 part one, and most people would think, oh, it must be 3x3 part two. No, it is not. It is 3x3b. So 3x3b is the access code of today's lab. And today's lab is relatively short compared to the one on last Thursday. So you only have until 11.50 to finish it. All right, so do we have any other questions before I stop the recording? Okay, if there are no questions, I will stop the recording and then I will upload this stuff to